Welcome to Redefining Balance for Working Moms podcast, where we believe life balance is possible. Uh, Yes, even for you. You might just have to redefine what it looks like for yourself. I'm your host, fellow working mom and founder of Your Life Rocks, Jenny Stemmerman. Each week, I'll bring you practical, real-life tips to help you focus on the things that matter most in life and be the best version of yourself in every area that God has called you to. Ready to redefine what balance looks like for you and your life? Let's go. Hello and welcome to the show. I am so excited that you're here to hang out with me today. You know, the last few episodes, we have been talking in a theme about summer because, well, it's summertime. And I don't know about you, but summertime is full of weddings. And that just makes me think so much about my marriage. And so that is what we're talking about today. And I'm joined by a special guest, and her name is Kimberly Walton. Now, one thing you should know about Kimberly is that she is the number one most repeated guest that I've had on the show. And I say repeated because I'm not sure if that's actually a word or not. I'm sure it is. It is now. We're using it because she has been on the show more times than any other guest. And there's a reason for that. Because when it comes to marriage, she is my go-to person. She is the one that I trust the most. She's full of grace and wisdom and so many practical tips. Because this is what she does all day, every day. And she helps women with their marriages. So today we're talking all about the promises that will strengthen your marriage. I mean, really, when we're thinking about this episode is about renewing your marriage vows, but not like a ceremony, more of a refresh of intent, a refresh of your heart, a refocus. So you can bring your marriage back to the forefront of importance and priorities in your life. But before we get into my interview with Kimberly, I want to remind you of our bonus content that we have for you when you join Life Balance Membership in the month of June or July. Now, as a member, you get access to a ton of courses, resources, planning tools, and so much more. But because I'm all about making things easy for you, I wanna bring a great resource to the forefront that you can find right from the get-go when you join that I think is really gonna benefit you through the summertime, and that is our meal planning tool. Now, this is something that I held a workshop on a few months back, part of our group coaching that we do every single month inside of the membership. And I'm going to email you a replay of the video and the worksheet that you will use every single week when you are doing your weekly planning to help you really nail down your meal planning. Now, that will be delivered right to your email box as soon as you join. And you can join by either upgrading right inside of the Your Life Rocks mobile app, or you can go to lifebalancemembership.com and learn more. Now, if this is your first time meeting Kimberly on the show, I will link to all of her past episodes in our show notes. You can go to yourliferocks.com to find all of those. But Kimberly Walton is a marriage mentor. She's a speaker, writer, and women's retreat leader who specializes in working with Christian women to create and nurture wildly successful marriages. She is the founder of Cherished Wives International, a coaching practice dedicated to strengthening marriages and increasing intimacy and connection through her unique in love approach. The in love program addresses the six principles that are part of a successful marriage by focusing on the whole person and taking a wholehearted approach. Kimberly comes from a place of personal experience and draws from her formal and informal education to mentor the how to's for developing greater intimacy, increased passion, embrace vulnerability and strengthen relationships. Kimberly believes in a solution-focused approach to strong marriages and blends in humor, tenderness, scripture, and even a touch. And she'll even call you on your stuff when you are working with her as a client, whether it be one-to-one or in a large group. Now, one of the things that I personally love about learning from Kimberly is that she's a very visual person. And so she does a lot of visual illustrations in the way that she teaches. But she just keeps it all very practical and applicable to right where you are in your marriage. So without further ado, let's get into my interview with Kimberly. Kimberly, welcome back to the podcast. It has been so long since we've had you on and I'm so excited to chat with you today. Yay, I'm happy to be back. It's like we do this like every six months sort of thing. I know, I know. And it's perfect timing because it's summertime and we're going to be talking about marriage and vows and all of that good stuff, which I think is so timely right now. And I think it's been a while since we've had you on. So I'm excited to learn from you today. But before we get into all of that, for our listeners who maybe haven't met you before, or this is their first time, or maybe it's just been a while since they've heard you on the show, remind them a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Sure. 
So my name is Kimberly, and I am the founder of CherishedWives.com. And my team and I are all about helping people create wildly successful marriages. And the approach that we take is very whole person, very balanced approach to marriage. And basically, we get that sometimes marriage can be hard and that we have tough seasons. And if you've got the right tools, you have a, the right understanding, and you have a little dose of inspiration and hope, then a lot of times we can navigate those seasons and we keep the pain and the discomfort to a minimum and a much happier marriage. And, and I know because I've been there. So that's our basic focus. But what we've been kind of doing lately is focusing a little bit more on pre-marriage counseling and even what I call remarriage counseling because we're finding more and more people are coming to us that are dealing with second marriages. I love so much that you do this. And I love that too, the way the Holy Spirit kind of works and has us connected to each other. I mean, I was for our listeners so that they know a little background. I was about ready to reach out to Kimberly and say, Hey, I would love to have you come on. You need to talk about marriage. And right before I could even send the email, I got an email from her saying, Hey, I want to come on the show and talk about <laughs> vows. Because, you know, when you think about summertime, there's so many weddings and there's a lot happening. And, you know, even for me, I've been married for almost 20 years. So I am far away from premarital counseling days, but it is like just such a great reminder that marriage is a choice that we we choose every single day and to give our best every single day. And so I think regardless of where people are in that marriage walk, whether they're getting ready to get married or they're ready to renew their vows or they're like me and they're just kind of in the thick of it, I think the things that you're going to share with us today are going to be really helpful for everybody. Yeah, well, I hope so. You know, and we are, we're in the season of marriage. I mean, that's what summer starting like in May, June, July, it's what it is. And I like to joke around and say that because of what my husband and I do, because he also does marriage counseling is we end up going to a lot of weddings. One summer, we actually went to six different weddings. And I love listening to people talk about their vows and the promises and things that they make to each other. And, and I love being a part of when they're excited and they're hopeful Although sometimes I listen to the vows and I go, ooh, that one's going to be really hard to keep. Or that's not realistic. We had somebody um, a year or so ago and the young woman promised, she goes, I promise to rub your back every night. I went, mm, oh, that, yeah. That's After the, yeah. I'll actually talk about that a little bit later. But I thought, oh, that's, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. But even after that day where we're, you know, the party's over and we're settling in and maybe even after the honeymoon phase is over, there's these promises and these vows that we make to each other that are beyond that particular day that we really need to keep on a regular basis. And so today I'm, I'm excited to share with you just four of them that I consider to be paramount. Like they're the four corners of a house that are going to be the vows and promises that we should be making and remaking on a regular basis in our marriages. And I'm so excited to get into those because the way that you always explain things is so visual. And I love that because I'm a very visual person. And to be able to create something that's kind of intangible, but present it in a visual way, especially on an audio podcast is a special skill and talent that you have. So I'm excited to dive into these. But before we dive into these four, Kimberly, talk to us a little bit about the importance of a vow and, and really truly that promise that we're making when we're doing our vows. Because I feel like sometimes in our culture these days, we are looking at marriage vows as kind of like this cute, fun thing that happens at weddings, but maybe not always looking at them for how serious they really are. Right. And I agree that a lot of times when you watch a wedding, whether it's something on TV that's like a Hallmark Channel thing, or it's actually going to a wedding, is the vows, when people make them, they are kind of cute and funny. And I love it when there's actually something that's kind of an inside joke for them but some of them are not, they're not real foundational. And what I have found in working with, with people is that the vows that we make really need to be foundational things. They need to be things that build us up. And if you think, and I don't want to talk about too much of like a house, but if you think about the house, the bones of the house and the walls and the corners and your roof and, and not the decoration inside, but the things that are the really foundational things that are still standing when times are tough. And it seems to me that, that we do have a little bit of a challenge in society right now with what vows really mean. I call them promises because they really are a promise to really, can we even carry them out? And just a slight different topic here on this, but related is 
I belong to a lot of Facebook groups that have to do with relationships and things like that. And I'm surprised at the number of ladies that will go on and say, oh my gosh, my husband's not being supportive or my husband's not this or whatever. I get that they're in the thick of it and things are tough. But the number of women that come back and say, oh, too bad, you know, adios, say goodbye. And it's like, this woman has kids. This woman has, she's in a struggle. We don't know the whole story. And so when we have a vow or a promise, whether it's to ourself to say, I'm going to be a a faithful wife or I'm going to be a strong mom or whatever, it's something that we have to treat as sacred. At times I find that we've, in our society, we've lost some of the sacredness of that vow and that promise. And it's too easy to toss things away. It's become kind of, you know, like, oh, it, yeah, whatever. And I don't agree with that because those things erode into the marriage. It's like, like if you've got a water leak and it's, you know, going up the side of your wall or something like that, it slowly erodes the, the foundation, uh, it creates mold in the, the environment and all that. And so I stress it, even though my clients are like, well, okay, whatever. And I'm like, no, no, seriously this is a promise you've made this other person to be there for them and thick and thin. And if they make that promise, then you've got trust, then you've got faith, then you've got hope, all of those things. And we don't always realize the other relating things when you are keeping those vows and those promises. Yeah, because it really is all connected. It truly Mm -hmm. is. And I think that that's, you know, where the the Bible calls us to be self-disciplined. I feel like so much of that goes into the promises, like you said, we make with ourselves, we make with other people, but especially the promises that we make with our spouse when we're entering into a marriage relationship. Right. And sometimes it is hard. It's hard to read because I was even thinking when we were getting ready for our our interview today, I don't even know if I remember the vows that I said on my wedding day because it was so long ago. And I don't know if I necessarily, like I entered into marriage understanding the weight of what marriage represents, but I don't know if I went into it understanding the weight of the vows precisely of of what it is that we were actually promising to each other. Right. And I love that you bring that up because that's not that unusual that a lot of clients, I will ask them, do you remember your vows? And the, the only people who really remember their vows are the ones who had it written down and they've kept it, but nobody else seems to remember it. And I tell them, you know what? That's fabulous. Let's remake your vows. And usually, you know, I just work with women. So what I will do is I will give my clients an assignment to say, what vow right now, knowing, looking back and seeing what's hard and what's easy and all that, what vows would you make or what would you recommend to somebody else? And so it's kind of exciting to see people who are maybe 10 years into a marriage who maybe are struggling to kind of take a step back and say, what vows do I want to make? What vows should I be making? And then for them to go to their mate and say, honey, I've done this. Can we talk about this? And what would you add to it? And in some ways, I think that not a whole full-on renewal of vows, but this kind of reinventing the vows with the maturity of a few years into the marriage. And it's kind of exciting to see that because people get a little bit giddy, they get excited, but they're also, there's a lot of wisdom in that. So I totally give you permission, Jenny, to do that, to make new vows with your husband. I love that idea. And I think the things that you're going to share like as I'm kind of looking ahead at the at the four vows and promises are really going to help spur ahead that because I know I'm not alone. I know in our audience, we have a lot of women who've been married for a long time and they might not remember their vows either. And even if they do, they might be in just a different place in life or might have grown into be a different person. And so I think that that's a great opportunity to give grace over everyone to be able to kind of redo that. And this is also where I just want to suggest for people, if you're looking to go a little bit deeper, if you're looking for some more specifics or some more inspiration, Kimberly has a really great ebook that you can get. It's free, isn't it, Kimberly? Your ebook it that you is. have? Yeah, it's yeah, 101 it is. things that wildly successful couples think, know, do, say, and practice. And I highly encourage that you go and grab that if you're in that same kind of position that I'm in and looking for some of that inspiration. And do they just find that on your website? Yeah, if they just go to the cherishedwives.com, they scroll down a little bit. It's on the front landing page. And you just sign in and you get it. And Because it's 101 things, normally what I tell people is you can either read it straight through if that fits you or just open it up at any random time and say, hey, what do I need to hear today? And to even use that as a devotional for the day. You know, what is this piece of wisdom? It's something that I got from working with a variety of clients and asking them, what's your best advice? It's not just me. It's advice from people who have been there and done that. And these are the things that they put together. 
I love it. And we'll link to that in our show notes as well. But let's get into these four promises that you've kind of helped us. Now that we're kind of in that mindset of, I don't want to say starting over, but giving a fresh start, a fresh look at the promises that we want to make to our spouse, what would be that first one? The first promise is to put the marriage first. And basically, if we start with the idea of a biblical scripture, which is Mark 10, 9, it says, what God has joined together, let no one put us under. And we've all heard that. We've heard it and heard it and heard it. But I want to use that as kind of the foundation for this. But at the same time, I want to mention that even though it's a really great scripture for this particular promise, even inside or outside of the Christian community, this is a really important vow and promise to make to each other. So let's take a look at this one first. Let no one put us under. I mean, what does that really mean? What does it mean when we say no one? I would actually add nothing as well, but it means not the husband, not the wife, not letting the in-laws interfere, not your girlfriends coming in and saying, oh, he shouldn't this or that or whatever. Most certainly not letting your exes involved in your life at all. Work, putting work first. I get sometimes that has to happen and we can talk about that a little bit, but you know, hobbies. And you know, I even say kids, don't let your kids come before your marriage. And we have to be really diligent about guarding our marriage against these, what I call foreign and domestic forces. And most people would agree. They say, yeah, I've got to put it first. And I'm obviously, I'm not talking about above God, but you know, God's at the top. We're going to just assume he's there and we're, we're we're the next step down, but people agree. But in, in my practice, I find it's really difficult for people to put their marriage first. And I know I can relate to this one and probably you. Interestingly, the biggest pushback I get when, when I talk to people about putting their marriage first is for moms and it relates to their kids. And I hear all the time, oh, my kids need me. My kids need me. I hear this repeatedly. And absolutely, your kids need you. Yes, they do. They need you to be the best mom you can be. But they also need you to be a really good, fabulous spouse and a really good partner. And they need you to lead by example when it comes to a healthy and successful marriage so that when they're all grown up, they have a model for a healthy marriage. But if your marriage isn't strong, your kids are going to play the parents against each other. There's going to be some weird problems with weird alignments. So you've got to put the marriage even above your kids. Now, obviously, if you've got a particular issue, a kid is sick or something like that, I understand those things. But in general, putting the children before marriage, and I'll tell you, especially is problematic in blended families. And we can save that one for a different conversation another day. But I find when we've got blended families, it's really, really hard for the marriage to come first. And I think that's one of the reasons that blended families are, in a lot of cases, have a higher failure rate than first marriages. Oh, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a blended family and there's just so many other elements and different things to consider when you're mixing that in a lot of different personalities and histories and all of that stuff. But I mean, even with not blended families. There's a lot that's going on. And especially, you know, women who are listening to this podcast, they're working moms. So they have a lot going on, a lot of things on their plate. And as you were talking about the things, you know, putting marriage first and all the things that can get in the way of that, talk to me a little bit about the difference between the time that you're doing, like the physical time and kind of the intentions piece of it. Because it reminds me a little bit of the way that we approach balance and life balance. The way that we talk about it here on the show is it's not necessarily... 50% of your time at work and 50% of your time at home and doing things with your family, but it is kind of more of that mindset or your intentions or the things that are priorities in your life, but not necessarily time spent. Is that the same thing here when you're talking about putting your marriage first? It is. And I think you are too. A lot of it's intention. Mm -hmm. And when I say put your marriage first, I mean that let's say that that you've got relationships with friends and they're wanting you to go do things, but you have a promise to do something with your mate. Do you bail on your mate? Or if you have hobbies that are taking away from family time. I had a lady I was working with a while ago and her husband loved to fish. I have nothing against fishing, right? We we talked about that already actually. But what was happening is the wife was getting really upset because it was taking him away on the weekends when they had date nights and things kind of planned. So he was he was like, oh, I'm going to go fishing with my friends. And she's like, wait, I thought we were going to go do this. And that's that loyalty to your partner is what I mean by put your marriage first. It also means you don't have, you're not Facebook friends with an ex, those kind of things. And I, I get that people have to work overtime. I get those different things. 
But in general, if your, if your career is taking the front seat to everything and your marriage is in the back seat, you may find in five years that your marriage is in a state of shambles. So it's checking in with your mate and asking them. And I have some assignments that I give my clients and I'll just tell you what those are now and we'll come back to that if we want. But I give these like homework assignments to my clients on a regular basis. Now, so I'm going to give them to your listeners now. I'll give them the homework assignment. And I'll say, are there things that you're putting before your marriage that are causing you to neglect, undermine, or otherwise not tend to the relationship? So that's the thing is whatever you're doing, is it causing you to neglect, undermine, or not tend to the relationship? And then the next part of that I ask is why? Because if it's a temporary thing, if it's a seasonal thing, and both partners are on the same page, knowing that things are being neglected, I'm going to cut them some slack, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a difference there because we know that sometimes we have these seasons where things happen. But if both partners are discussing it on the same page, then it's still putting the marriage first because you're still considering your partner. But we also have to ask, if there are those things, you know, to really delve into it. How is it affecting you? How is it affecting your mate, your overall happiness? And depending on the state of the relationship with my different clients and the listeners, I usually ask my clients to do kind of a homework assignment with their mate and say, once a week, if they can do it daily, great, but usually it's, it's too much. But once a week, ask your mate, what did I do this week that made you feel like I put me in the marriage first? And what did I do this week that made you feel like I did not put me or the marriage first? And both people do it with each other. Mm, that's a really great question. It is. And you'd be surprised at the answers. I've had clients come back and say, when I told my husband I was planning meals for the week and I asked him what meal I could make that knowing that he had a busy week. And she was like, I was shocked. I was shocked that that little thing made him feel significant. I'm like, see, unless we ask these questions, we don't know. We're making assumptions. Yeah. And it is always the little things, both on the positive and on the negative. I have mm-hmm. found like when our, in our marriage, it's always like whenever we are discussing something similar, you know, of, of what we could do to improve our marriage, it's always like the smallest things that he brings up that I'm like, oh, I didn't, I had no idea it affected you that way. And I'm so glad that you brought it up because sometimes the small things we overlook so easily. Right. And it's got to be the positive and the negative. It, it, there has to be uh, an opportunity to discuss the things that are not making each other happy. And it needs to be as simple because people go off into these big old topics. And I say, we're not solving it. We're just going to share the information. We're going to each think about it. You and your partner are going to think about it. Then we'll talk about solving it later because this is just meant to be a short little check-in. What made you feel great this week? You know, what made you feel undervalued this week? And a way to learn. And again, every time clients are like, I had no idea. Unless we talk about it, we just don't know. Yeah, so, so true. And I feel like this is such a great segue into the promise number two, because I feel like some things could come up (laughs) that might need the promise number two that you have for us. So let's talk about that. Yeah, promise number two is to forgive regularly and often. And, you know, we're such flawed humans. We will make mistakes. We will fail. We will hurt one another. It's giving. I mean, you're not in a marriage if you haven't said something that's hurt your mate's feelings, done something, been inconsiderate, and it goes both ways. So we really, if we want to have a wildly successful marriage, we have to be great at forgiving. And that means we've got to forgive regularly. We've got to forgive fully. And that's one of the problems is we say we forgive, but we don't always do that. I have a Facebook meme that I put up on my cherished wife's Facebook page, like quarterly, that always gets a lot of reaction and engagement. It basically says, you know, a strong and happy marriage is the result of two people good at forgiving. And anybody who's been married for more than a minute knows that, yeah, you've got to have two people who are willing to forgive, whether it was something that was done knowingly or accidentally, you got to forgive it. And those things, sometimes they're harder. I even tell people, you have to be willing to forgive the things that each of you said when you were hangry, even, <laughs> yes. you know, yes. because I've done that. I'm like, I snapped at my husband and went, oh, that was hunger talking. Yeah. And it's not acceptable, but your maid has to be able to, you know, go, okay, that was said because we were hungry, not because, you know, 
Yeah. So, yeah. And actually, as you're saying that, I was thinking, going back to that first promise of putting marriage first, sometimes I do not treat my husband well. Like I will sit, snap or I'll say something that I don't necessarily mean. And it's because I'm not being present with him. I'm not putting marriage first in my mind at that moment. My head is someplace else. I'm still mm-hmm. thinking about the frustrations from my work day or something that's going on with the kids. And I'm letting that emotion take out on him when it ha- has absolutely nothing to do with him. Right. And I find when it comes to the idea of putting marriage first, the things that get in the way, we typically have patterns. And I will ask people, is it more likely people that are getting in the way of you putting your marriage first? Are there things? Sometimes it's beliefs that people have. What is it that tends to be your your thing that you let put or get before the marriage? And so for you, it might be work and that, that your mind is still racing on something else. And once you know that, then you can say, okay, this is my pattern. I can be more conscious of it. But unless we really look at it, we don't always know that. Right, so good. So on this forgiveness thing, I have a rule that I I make my clients promise me. I say, we must promise that we're never going to tell our mate we forgive them unless we truly actually forgive them. Because people will say, oh, I forgive you, but they haven't really. And I get it. Some things are so much easier to forgive than others. Some offenses are really, they're going to take years for people to overcome. But we have to learn, in the long run at least, to forgive without having strings attached. And it's not that uncommon for people to do kind of a bargaining saying, well, I'll forgive you if. And that's not really forgiveness. That's not saying that I truly forgive you. That usually means that whatever somebody is upset about is going to come back in the future. That scenario is going to keep being brought up again and again. Well, remember that time you, remember that time you, I would rather have people say, it's really hard for me to forgive at this time. I need more time. That's more authentic. That's more vulnerable rather than to keep bringing it up, especially because I find that men tend to be in a situation where if you say you forgive them and you're not really talking about it, they're like, okay, we're all good. But then it comes up and they're like, well, what the heck? I thought we were over this. It's not, it, it doesn't help the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't move past it because if they think it's done, it's water under the bridge, but it's still a chip on your shoulder or something that's eating at your heart that can cause bitterness. I mean, that can be very disastrous down the road. Right. And I say that we have like filing cabinets. We file things in these filing cabinets and our mates a lot of times think the filing cabinet is shut, maybe even locked. We don't even know where the key is at. And we go to that filing cabinet, we pull that thing out, we pull out this file and we go, hey, look, remember this from <laughs> yes. from December of 2012? And they're like, uh, what? No, what, <laughs> what? And so the filing cabinet needs to be used appropriately. We need to have the filing cabinet where we pull things out and go, remember in December 2012, when we had that really great, we had that flat tire, but we all worked together and you know all that. That's where you want to use your filing cabinet, not to bring up old stuff. But seriously, here's the thing. If people are bringing up old stuff, that means that they haven't healed from it. And it's just a clue. It's telling us that I'm still hurt. I'm still hurt by this and we haven't fixed it. It may not be on the forefront, but I'm still hurt. And sometimes that's because the partner hasn't hasn't really expressed that they're truly fully sorry or maybe feel like somebody's repented. They haven't really heard the partner's plea or cry for help. They're still feeling wounded and they've got maybe trying to sweep it under the carpet kind of thing. And so I don't want to be flipping about that and say, oh my gosh, we just got to forgive because some things, you know, there's some pretty deep wounds and some people are more vulnerable because you've, you've pushed a wound that they had wounded before. And we don't always communicate that. We don't always tell people, this is a wound and I I really need you to not push this. And it gets pushed and pushed and pushed and we get hurt. Then it's harder to forgive because sometimes it's somebody else's drama. It's not even your mates. It's something that somebody else did. And we don't always recognize that. Sometimes the person we have to forgive is ourself Mm -hmm. or people from our past. And some of those hurts are pretty deep. They're pretty big scars. And, you know, maybe somebody grew up in a household that, there was just no trust in the family. Maybe they had a parent that did said things that really made them feel undervalued. Maybe somebody, you know, one of the partners has spent too much money and now they're in a financial ruins. You know, maybe a partner's had an affair. 
So I'm not being flippant when I say let's forgive often and, and forgive, go in and, and forgive hard because some things are going to take time. But I'll tell you, here's an exercise I give my clients. If you have somebody you have to forgive, whether it's yourself or your partner or somebody else, imagine them on a stage, looking at them, shrink them down to a child. And I mean a child like the age of five. Shrink them down to a small child. Imagine them wearing like a t-shirt. And on that t-shirt is whatever the issue is that is for them. So I had a client a while ago, her husband was addicted to porn. And so we shrunk her child, her husband down to the size of a child had him put a shirt on it, said addicted to porn. And I said, now, as a child, he was not addicted to porn. There's something that happened between that five-year-old and as an adult. I want you to forgive him as a five-year-old before he was addicted. And she just lost it. She just started to cry. She goes, oh my gosh. I said, and then imagine him at six and seven. And then when he got to be a teenager and got exposed to things, forgive him because she could not forgive him. But she could forgive him when he was a kid. Yeah. And sometimes we have to start there with the innocent little child because who wouldn't forgive a five-year-old? Right. Yeah. Right. And especially if it's something that happened before, you know, something that got initiated in this case, the husband with porn, before they were even together. And so sometimes forgiveness is, is really not easy. And I get that. Oh, yeah. And would you recommend if anyone who's listening to this right now and they're like, I am there, like there's things in the filing cabinet that keep popping open and I get the importance of forgiving regularly and often, but I I just can't do it. I can't get past this one thing. Would you recommend that they reach out and get some help to talk to someone to talk through some of these things? Yes and no. I want you to reach out, but my goal would be to reach out to the mate first. If it's your mate that's that's you feel wounded you. If it's something from your past where maybe somebody's ha- been abused or something like that, then yes, I would definitely reach out for some sort of counseling or therapy. Because one of the things about going to a counselor or a therapist is you've got somebody that you're in a relationship with that it doesn't matter necessarily what they think of you. They're not going to look at you funny or anything like that. With your mate, if you start telling your mate certain things from your past, like you maybe were molested or something like that, we're afraid that it's going to change how they look at us. We're afraid that it might change our relationship. Doesn't mean you won't tell your mate about it, but they're not your counselor. They're not your therapist. You want them to be your confidant and your, your right hand and all that. But for those deeper issues, yes, go seek professional help. But if it's something that your mate has said or done that slighted you, then I'm going to say you're going to have to have a vulnerable conversation with your mate. And say, hey, honey, remember this, you know, very soft and gentle say, remember this like five years ago when we were at your sister-in-law's and your brother and you said this thing and everybody laughed at me and I was the butt of the joke and I'm I'm trying to make up something from a previous client here. So I apologize if it's silly. And you say, you know, I remember these things and I really, when everybody laughed at me and, and you laughed at me and my face got all red and all that. I felt humiliated and I felt like I was the butt of jokes and I felt like I couldn't trust you anymore and I couldn't tell you my secrets anymore and all this stuff and say, that's why this keeps coming up. That's why I find I keep pulling these things out of the filing cabinet and I need your help. And that vulnerable conversation, if it's handled well, you know, the right timing and all that, that can bring a marriage closer. It can make a marriage stronger. Mm. And That's not something you necessarily have with talking to a therapist. That's the conversation you have with your mate. You got to say, I know I keep pulling this file out of the filing cabinet. I don't know why. And I need to talk to you about it because I don't want to keep wounding you. And I don't want to stay in this place. So you're going to have to have a conversation with your mate if you've got a filing cabinet issue. Got it. So it's really taking your own personal accountability, responsibility to deal with those issues that are coming up. Yes, because... Keeping them stuck in the filing cabinet, we keep pulling them out, doesn't help you. This is an opportunity for the marriage to grow stronger and to be vulnerable, which really should be a four letter word based on how people feel about it. It's a great opportunity, but it's scary. Oh, yeah. It's so completely scary because you've already built this whole story and this whole thing around it in your head. Because I find, at least for me, that's what I find is when I have those filing cabinet things that keep popping up. Every time it pops up, I add more emotion to it or more story into it or more depth into it that probably was never even there. 
Yep. You add another page to the file. Think of it like a little file folder yes. you pulled out and on now, and I'm adding this to it. I'm adding this to it. And I'm going to keep adding to it. And sometimes we pull it out. We don't even show our mate, but we add something to it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, this file that was half a page with three words on it now is like, it needs like to be stapled in and, and everything else because there's so <laughs> many loose pages. It's like, what are we doing? Yes, yes. And it just reminds me of, you know, Jesus asking the man, like, do you want to be healed? Like, do you mm-hmm. want to just file this done and close it and lock it and not come back to it? Or do you want to keep adding things to the file, which you really want to have in your life? And optimistically, we're going to say the first one, we want it to yes, be closed. Of course. Um, <laughs> but, but sometimes it's harder. You know, something comes up and you're like, oh, oh. And I have filing cabinet moments. And I'll even say something to my husband. I'll look at him. I go, oh, I'm having a filing cabinet moment. And he'll like, you want to talk about it? I'm like, let me think about it first. And, you know, and, and we'll go from there. And I have to catch myself and, and I'll be like, ooh, and, and it's become verbiage for us. And he'll just be like, okay, let me know, you know, and being aware of it really, really empowers people. Yeah, I love that. And I, you know, this, I think is a great lead way into your third vow, which is around happiness and your own responsibility for that. So share with us a little bit on how this idea of happiness kind of works into vows. Right. So the vow with happiness is the idea of being responsible for your own happiness and or unhappiness, because we can only control ourselves. And so making ourselves responsible for our own happiness or unhappiness means we also have the ability to fix it. And I love romantic comedies and things like that. But you know, the romantic comedies and romance novels and fairy tales, they always depict this happily ever after that people are seeking. But the truth is, they're myths. And, you know, finding the man of your dreams and riding off into the sunset and happily ever after without any problems is not a reality. So it's how do I navigate those problems, those those things that are going to come up, we're going to have lots of transitions in front of any couple things are going to come out of left field and blindside you. And you're going to be like, what the heck, I didn't plan for this. And I actually wrote an article a while ago on my blog about a bunch of different fairy tales. And I made a joke about how the fairy tales, you know, they ride off into the sunset and what really happens. And I joke around like Rapunzel, you know, the one with the long hair, she's got headaches now because her hair was so long and it's pulling and, and we've got, you know, Snow White and her apples. She's allergic to apples because, you know, she was poisoned with apples and now she's highly sensitive to foods. And I mean, this is the reality. So the idea of, you know, I mentioned earlier, promising to rub your hubby's back every night. I love that idea. But what happens when somebody's sick with the flu? What happens when there's a new baby and the second baby? What happens if you've got a parent in the hospital or somebody's struggling at work? I mean, so many things are going to interfere in that. What I would have rather had in that case is that they say, I promise to acknowledge the things that make you happy and to do my very best to be a part of those. Because that's what she was really saying is, Mm -hmm. I know me rubbing your back makes you feel loved and cared for. But if it's a promise to do this every night, that's going to be a problem. So we have to recognize that each of us is really responsible for our own completion. And that's from, you know, the Jerry Maguire movie where they're like, you complete me. But we're also responsible for our own happiness. And it can be empowering to do this because then you're not holding your mate hostage or blaming them when you're unhappy. Because yeah, your mate can say something mean, they can pull their own filing cabinet stuff out. But how you choose to react, what you choose to do with that really says a lot. You know, we've got to promise to joyfully contribute to our mutual happiness, but your mate is never going to make you happy. And they don't make you unhappy. They can contribute to those things. And what you do with that is significant. And it's great if we're, we're all rowing in the same direction to you know the shore that we want to be on. But again, we're, we're imperfect humans. We're going to say and do things. We have deficits. We have strengths. And just because you're in love, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect. So we want to find the courage to love, the courage to believe in ourselves, no matter what, the courage to believe in our mates. And when we do this, it can empower us to also have you know, some gratitude. And it can also empower us to be stronger. But if we're waiting for our mate to make us happy, if we're waiting for our mate to fix everything, that's a huge burden to put on them when they're going to run their own life as well. And so I really caution people to say, vow to make yourself responsible 
Now, the second part of this is that means you've also got to communicate your needs. Mm -hmm. That's hard. It's It's hard to say, I need this because gosh, if I say I need this and then I don't get it, it really, really sucks. If I tell you I need this certain thing, you know, we just had Mother's Day a while ago and on several of the Facebook groups that I'm in, my heart was broken because these women were like, I didn't get anything for Mother's Day. You know, I've got a newborn baby and a five-year-old and my husband did nothing. And I was like, oh, oh, you know, my heart just broke. But then I wondered if part of that was, and I'm not being insensitive here, but part of it was that they said to their husband, oh, it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. If it is a big deal, you need to say it's a big deal. You need to say, honey, we got two kids and I'm overwhelmed because we've got a newborn. And what would make me feel the most happiest as a mom and as your wife is if I got breakfast in bed or if you took the kids out for three hours and I just took a nap, let them know what you want. But we don't want to do that. Typically, as women, we're afraid to do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Or we want to be surprised. I mean, I know for me, for Mother's Day, I told my husband, I said, you know what I want for Mother's Day? I don't want to make any decisions. I don't want to tell you where I want to eat. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what I want you to make or what I want you to buy. And I'm not saying that I even need you to buy anything, but I want to at least go somewhere to eat and I don't want to choose where it's at. Because normally he's like, well, where do you want to go? Anywhere you want to go. And I said, I make decisions all day long. For Mm -hmm. Mother's Day, I don't want to make a decision. You have to pick. And he did. And it was great. And it was wonderful. But I'll tell you how many Mother's Days, how many Valentine's Days, how many anniversaries and birthdays I spent crying. And I was one of those women. I you know, never posted about it on social media because that's just not who I am, but I, my heart hurt for those people. Cause I, I saw those same messages and I've been there before, but it took me a long time to learn to ask for what would make me happy and what it is that I wanted. And it honestly, it was from couples counseling where my husband and I had to learn this lesson that I don't own his happiness and he doesn't own my happiness. We have to own that for ourselves. And we have to communicate with each other what would make us happy. Mm-hmm. But that was a and long, I- hard road. Yeah, I think there's real value in letting go of the, I just want him to surprise me. Because Mm -hmm. most men that I know, that is like treacherous territory. Because the, I'm going to surprise you is, I have so many ways I can screw this up. There are so many things I can do wrong. Because even when we say, I want to surprise, we still kind of have an idea of what we're thinking. And they're afraid that they're going to not do the right thing. And I love that you said to him, I don't want to make decisions, but I do want to go to lunch because it's like, does she want this? Does she want, I don't know. It's okay to give them ideas of what you want and then say, run with it. But we are so afraid to say that. We're so afraid to say, look, I want you to show me that you love me. I want you to show me different things. And, you know, and any given Mother's Day will be different because there'll be different things going on this year for Mother's Day. I asked for time alone because this was my first year without my mom. And so it's like, okay. I told my husband, said, go spend the day with your mom. I want time alone. And then the next day, my husband, and this, I'm so practical, he did stuff in the yard because we were getting ready to have this big party in the backyard for my son's graduation. He went and bought cushions for these chairs and he bought me a couple more chairs that I needed because we were having like 50 people. And he bought me an umbrella stand for extra shade. And I didn't ask for those things, but they were things we were going to do. And he said, this is what I wanted to do for Mother's Day. I gave you time off that you wanted, and this is what I did. And so I think that if I had said, oh, well, I don't want to tell him I want to be alone. If I um, I just, you know, okay, I'll muddle through it, then I wouldn't have been authentic with him. He wouldn't have been able to meet my needs. But, you know, I get it. It is scary. It's really, really scary to say what you want, because if we don't get what we asked for, then we feel even worse. We feel like even less valued. You know, it's, it's one of those things where when we, when we try to communicate our needs, sometimes it comes out really ugly. Sometimes we pull from the filing cabinet and say, well, I know you're not going to do this because you didn't on this date, this date, this date. And most guys and most listeners probably have decent men in their lives. They just don't know what to do to make you happy. So if you tell them gently and kindly and you set them up to succeed, you would find in a lot of cases that they're going to step up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, my husband, you know, we think about like the love languages. He's very far away from 
gift giving as a love language. Like he just doesn't, it's not even on his radar that gift giving (laughs) would be a thing. And he's not a very affectionate person. My love language happens to be physical affection and his love language is like words of appreciation. So when he comes to me and he's like, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. I know that's his way of trying to show me love. (laughs) And And for the longest times for years, I would just brush it off and be like, okay, whatever, like that doesn't, But then I was able to kind of be able to think about those love languages and talk to him about it. So he knows like if I'm having a bad day, I need you to come over and give me a hug. More than tell me you appreciate me, I need a hug. Like if you're having a bad day, I know I can tell you I appreciate you and everything that you're doing and that will help you, but we're different. And I think that having the the courage to have conversations around things that are going on in our lives and in our marriage are really truly like the key of being able to figure that out. And like you always share, you and your husband have different keywords <laughs> that you guys say. And mm-hmm. it's like an immediate understanding of where you're at, what you're talking about and what you're going on. Yeah. And I love how you reframe that because it's so easy to filter everything through our own thoughts and patterns and forget that our mate is actually trying to communicate what we want. It's just like in a different dialect. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we're on the West Coast, but if we go to the East Coast, or even if we were like in, say, Texas, people might be using the same words, but we're like, we really have to strain to understand what they're saying because it's like, wait, car, car, what, what, yes. you know, even though we're using the same words. So we have to reframe those things. We have to sometimes slow things down in order to really know what's going on. And I think what you're doing, like with your husband, is like just reframing it where he's, I know if he gives me this, this is his way of saying, I love you because this is how I know how to say this word. Or this thing. And I do that with my husband where I'm like, hey, I need a hug. I really need a hug right now. And he's like, I got, I'm on it. I'm on it. You know, it's hard to ask for that. Yeah. And, and sometimes we have to say, I really need a hug, but maybe it's the middle of the day and our husband's at work. And it's okay to reach out and send him a text and go, hey, I'm having a really bad day. When you get home, can you give me like the best hug ever? And I bet you, you'd get back from your husband, in most cases, something that says, I'm on it. Or they might hug you through the phone or they might call you, you know, our own happiness, setting ourselves up for our own happiness means we give our mate a chance to help us with that. Again, it's not easy. I get it. You know, and, and part of this is self-care and those kind of things. Another assignment I would give if the listeners here were my clients is I would ask them, how do you communicate if you have some sort of an unmet need? How do you tell your mate that, that I have this need for something that is not get, getting met? And how do you do that? Does it come out venomous? Does it come out like, Bleh! or does it come out, you know, in tears? What is it? Is it effective? You know, the timing, the approach, the attitude, all of those things are crucial for people to get what they want. And again, letting our needs be known, it's vulnerable. It's scary. Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. But so needed as are all of these great promises that you have us going through. So just let's recap the first three before we hit number four. Number one is to promise to put your marriage first. Number Mm -hmm. two, promise to forgive regularly, often. And I'm going to add in the fully because I think that that was so valuable (laughs) on there. And then we just covered vow to make yourself responsible for your own happiness or unhappiness. What is the fourth vow and promise? The fourth one is to understand that there are no egalitarian marriages. And that's the idea that everything's going to be 50-50. It just doesn't happen. It's a great goal, but it just doesn't happen. And there's so much talk these days with people like, oh, I want everything even, Stephen. And it just doesn't work out. I don't even know that it's possible just because of the ebbs and flows in life. I was actually just reading something the other day where I guess the new thing is instead of prenups, people are doing baby nups. What? And Yeah, it's this idea where a couple, before they have children, they sit down and write up an agreement that says, what are they going to do for schooling? What's their parenting approach? I'm assuming that there's religious upbringing talked about in there. You know, what happens if there's divorce? How do they do custody situations? All that. And I'm like, wow. Wow. Life just doesn't work like that. Wow. I've never heard of that ever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and going and even talking about what happens with divorce, it's like, yeah that's not where I want to be headed. So yeah, I mean, and I love certainty. And this is all about people wanting certainty. I love certainty. If your listeners knew how hard I try in everything I do because I seek certainty, they would be surprised. But I understand also certainty is just an illusion. So the idea of egalitarian or 50-50 relationships, those relationships, they don't thrive. And a lot of them don't even survive. So two humans with different strengths, different weaknesses, different abilities, 
they need to find their rhythm. There's, you know, there's those ebbs and flows. I have yet to find any couple where both people are strong at the same time. Oh, it just yeah. doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And when people are, are shooting for a 50-50 relationship, an egalitarian relationship, it leads to scorekeeping. It leads to being overly critical. It leads to looking at your mate and looking at, well, you didn't do this part. It's just a trap and it undermines your marriage. Basically, people are just you know set up to fail. So I say promise to give your mate and your marriage 100% of all, at all times of what you can. Okay, understanding that both of you at times are going to fail. It's rare again that both of you are going to be strong at the same time. It just doesn't happen. I mean, I've never run across that. One person being strong for the other is really what happens. But here's the thing. In those times where your mate's the weak one, it's your job to be strong for your mate. And the times when you're the weak one, they're supposed to be strong for you. And that's, that's ideal. I just actually, I think today I put up a post on my Facebook page and says, when your mate is stuck in the valley, it's important you don't join them. Mm, Instead, wow, that's powerful. <laughs> right? Instead, climb up as far as you can, fasten yourself in with everything you've got, and then use all of your resources to help your partner. Help them. You've got to use pulleys, ladders, ropes, whatever your resources are, but don't join them in the valley. And that's what people do when somebody's like, oh, well, you know, you didn't this. Oh, well, you didn't this. And now you're both in the valley. Mm -hmm. How does that help anything? Now you're both stuck in a hole. So one of you has to be strong and use a tag team method if you got to, but one of you has got to be strong. It's got to be there to help bring the other person up. And that's not what we see in TV or it's not what we see as examples. Usually it's the tit for tat, you know, or everything's either perfect and it's when everything's perfect between everything, everybody, then yeah, that's an easy marriage, but that's just not how most of it is. You know, we have tough times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially as the years of marriage progress on, there are times that, you know, you might be growing or they might be stagnant and or might be vice versa or someone's career takes off and someone's career takes a decline and financial things. I mean, there's just so much of mm -hmm. life that you go through when you're experiencing it right alongside somebody. And you both have different lives. Even though you're sharing a life together, you have different things that you're going through and different ways that different things affect you differently. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely love that you have this as one of those four promises that are in there. How do we apply this to our lives? For those people that are like, I think I have been expecting that <laughs> to be the case and it's not. And how do they apply this promise to their life? Well, let me just say one of the things I would say, if this is something somebody's dealing with, I would ask them to look at what do they do when their mate is in the valley? What is their habit? Because Usually when people are stuck in this egalitarian situation, they're basically saying, I don't ever want you to be in the valley and I don't want to be responsible for bringing you out of the valley because that's kind of what it's saying, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So ask yourself, what do you do when your mate is in the valley? Do you make it worse? Do you kind of throw dirt on them? Have you asked your mate what they need when they're in the valley? Because we know a lot of times it's like what they needed is not what we gave them, okay? And also you want to ask about when you're in the valley, because it's not just your mate that gets in the valley. Sometimes it's you that needs the pulleys and the ropes and all that. When you're in the valley, what do you need? That particular assignment a lot of times helps people to realize that the 50-50 isn't working, okay? I think people need to look at what are each person's strengths and then divide up from there. And if there is something in the marriage that both of you hate doing, whether it be toilets or shuttling kids to soccer practice or whatever, I say do everything you can if both of you hate doing that to get somebody else to help you with it. Whether you pay them to do it and not everybody has the money or you work out carpool or you do something else. If there's something that both of you hate, it shouldn't fall to just one person or make fun at it. Like I'm not a big fan of certain household chores. So my husband and I sometimes will do those together. We'll put music on and we'll do things around the house together. And then it's less of a chore. Not like you have to vacuum every, every other Wednesday and I vacuum every other Wednesday. There's no scorekeeping. I actually wrote an article on this a while ago too. It's on my Cherished Wives page about it. And there's four issues that I give people like why you don't want to shoot for the egalitarian. You want to shoot for balance. And I know your listeners like balance. You want to shoot for balance, but in balance, you've got the teeter-totter. Mm -hmm. You've got the valley 
and you've got the mountaintop. Yeah. You've got the valley and the mountaintop. And the person who's down in the valley pushes up and the person who's, and so you're taking turns and there's a joy and there's a balance in it. If you're just all balanced, it's kind of boring when you're sitting there and your feet are dangling, right? <laughs> right. Nothing's happening. I know. You're like, well, this is fun, right? It's when you push off and all that and you're there and you get to ride up from the valley. So with the idea of the 50-50 marriages, it's understanding that both of you are going to spend time in the valley. Both of you are going to spend time in the mountain. You may not always be there together. It's great if you are, but what can you do to help your partner not stay stuck in the valley? Because honestly, the valley sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to get out of. Like if you're both down there and you don't have someone else to help pull you out, it's a trek to get back out. But people voluntarily go to the valley. Their mates down there and you jump in with them and you just, you start sparring it out. That doesn't help you with a strong (laughs) one. You're, you need to, wait, wait, we had resources to get them out of the valley. Yeah. You you opened up the file cabinet. You did. (laughs) And yeah, you did, you know? So that's really how I find most people can get out of the, everything has to be 50, 50 is to say, yeah, I'm in the Valley. You're in the Valley. What can we do when you're in the Valley? What do you need me to do for you? I love it. That's so good. Well, Kimberly, this has been so awesome. These promises. And I, like I said before, at the very beginning of the show, I think it's so timely because summer is the time of marriage and we're thinking about marriage, we're going to weddings, but it's such a great time for us to refresh our own promises in our own marriage. And again, I want to encourage everyone to get Kimberly's free ebook, 101 Things Wildly Successful Couples Think, Know, Do, Say, and Practice. So it can help you kind of put together your own promises and vows. And Kimberly, where can people learn more about you? Sure. Well, our website at cherishedwives.com. Or um, we're also on Facebook at Cherished Wives. So it's, you know, there's a pattern here. And even on Pinterest, we have a lot of stuff posted up on Pinterest at well. I'm not currently on Instagram. I think I need to do that because people keep telling me to. But basically, just look up cherishedwives.com and you can find us. Or if they're um, listening to the podcast, I know that little show notes at the bottom have links to everything. Lots, we have lots of articles, lots of resources. And if somebody is stuck and they want to just, we do like 20 minute consults for people. One of my biggest things I like to tell people is don't wait to get help. It doesn't mean you have to come to me or anybody in in my organization. But if you're struggling in marriage, don't wait. Don't think it's just going to blow over. Get help. Talk to wise counsel. And if you think we might be somebody that you want to work with our organization, um, we do a free consultation. It's just a 20-minute chat. And I've had people go, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed. I'm like, okay, we're done. We're good, you know. So my mission is is to make a dent in the divorce rate and to help people have stronger marriages. So reach out to us, visit our website, read articles, and keep listening to the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And Kimberly, I'll link to all of the past episodes because she's got a lot of great wisdom that she's already shared on the show. And she's also in our free community on Facebook as well. So you can find her in there too. Well, Kimberly, thank you so much as always for being so amazing and pouring so much wisdom and grace into everyone's life today. You're such a blessing. Oh, thank you for having me. It's always a treat. And thanks for allowing me to share some of this stuff that I see happening that maybe, you know, maybe we can just make a little dent here and there. And there you go. Regardless of wherever you are in your marriage, I hope that this episode blesses you. I hope it renews you. And I just pray that it would spark something inside your marriage for it to become stronger, for God to surround you and your spouse and really create something new and exciting for the both of you. Now, like I said, Kimberly is in our community and I hope that you go and you get her free ebook because it is so full of so much wisdom. And like she said, it's not even just all her. She's gotten this wisdom from a lot of other successful marriages as well. Now, we are going to link to everything Kimberly on the show notes page and also in our community. And I don't do this for every single guest, but I truly believe in everything that Kimberly has to say and offer. And I really do think that it is going to be blessing so many of you that are listening to this podcast. Now, if you haven't done so yet, I hope that you hit subscribe because we have a lot of awesome episodes coming up for you, including a summer challenge that I think is going to be so refreshing and so much fun for us all to be doing together. So until then, keep building a life that rocks. Bye. Just because the episode's over doesn't mean that we have to stop hanging out. Of course, you can follow me over on Instagram at your.life.rocks or hop on over to Facebook, search Your Life Rocks, 
and find our Facebook community. It is full of working Christian moms just like you, looking to redefine what balance means in their life and take action 